Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we come to you now and ask that you draw near to each one of us as we open your word and search those things that you have revealed to make us wise unto salvation. Let your spirit teach us your truth and your will in our lives. I pray in the name of your Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. I've changed the title of this week's lesson from An Everlasting Covenant to The Everlasting Covenant. We're going to be studying the Everlasting Covenant given to Abraham by Yehovah. It is the covenant that was given to Adam before the fall, and the covenant given after the fall, the covenant given to Noah, to Abraham and his seed, and to us through the Messiah. Galatians 3.29 says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The covenant is a promise. For a sinless life of eternity in the presence of our God, the covenant always has been obey and live, disobey and die. We're going to read, well, the memory verse is Genesis 17, 7, but I'm going to read 1 through 9. And when Abraham was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed, after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Yahovah changed Abram's name from exalted father to Abraham, father of a multitude, and he established his covenant with him and his seed. In the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1092, it says, After the flood, the people once more increased on the earth, and wickedness also increased. Idolatry became well-nigh universal, and the Lord finally left the hardened transgressors to follow their evil ways. While he chose Abraham, of the line of Shem and made him the keeper of his law for future generations. In that age, idolatry was fast creeping in and conflicting with the worship of the true God. But Abraham did not become an idolater, even though his own father was vacillating between the true and the false worship. And with his knowledge of the truth 
false theories and idolatrous practices were mingled. Abraham kept free from this infatuation. He was not ashamed of his faith and made no effort to hide the fact that he made God his trust. He builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. If it were not possible for human beings under the Abrahamic covenant to keep the commandments of God, every soul of us is lost. The Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of grace. By grace are ye saved. John 1, 11 and 12. On Sunday's lesson, Yahovah and the Abrahamic Covenant, you see I changed the name of that one too, <laughs> from Yahweh. In uh, let's see, Genesis 15, Genesis 15, 7. Fifteen seven. It says, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give unto thee this land to inherit it. The Hebrews named their children after personal characteristics or thoughts and emotions of the one giving the name or circumstances at the time. God's name is no different. It definitely has deep meaning. And he has given us many names showing us his character. God wanted Abram to know who it was that called him out from Ur of the Chaldees. He told him his name, Yahovah. The Hebrew letters, yod He vav He. I gave a study here several years ago about the Masoretic, Masoretic manuscripts that have been found in the last several years <clears throat> with the vowel markers showing that the pronunciation is Yahovah and not Yahweh, as the lesson states. I think at the time of the study they had just found the thousandth manuscript in that year, or it was actually less than a year, they went from finding five manuscripts to over a thousand, and today they have found thousands and thousands of manuscripts with the vowel markers confirming the pronunciation. For such a time as this, when his people will know his name at the end of time, in Isaiah 52.6, it says, therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Revelation 14, 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. If 144,000 are good to have his father's name written in their foreheads, don't you think that they're going to know his name? Yes, I think so. But it just shows that Strong's Concordance has been right all along. It has always shown that the pronunciation is Yahovah. Notice that each time the Lord calls his people to a covenant relationship with him. He calls them out from the world of sin in their environment where they are living. He called Abram out of Ur. He called his descendants, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And today, he calls us individually out of the satanic world around us into a close relationship with him and enables us to do his will in our lives and to prepare us for his heavenly kingdom of the promise. Okay, back to Sunday's lesson. 
In Exodus 3, 3 through 14, it says, Exodus 3, 3 through 14. It says, and Moses said, no, that doesn't seem to be the right verse. Exodus 3, 13 and 14. Okay. 13 and 14. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And, the, and God said to me, unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me to you. I am is the Hebrew haya, meaning to exist. And he repeats it twice, giving the meaning of the self-existing one. The bottom of page four, uh, the bottom of the fourth paragraph, I'm sorry, on, on Sunday's lesson, says that it points to the Lord as the living God, the source of life, in contrast with the gods of the heathen, which had no existence apart from the imagination of their worshipers. In the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1099, it says, I am means an eternal presence. The past, present, and future alike are alike to God. He sees the most remote events of past history and the far distant future with as clear a vision as we do those things that are transpiring daily. We know not what is before us, and if we did, it would not contribute to our eternal welfare. God gives us an opportunity to exercise faith and trust in the great I Am. Moving over to Monday's lesson, it discusses El Shaddai, the Almighty God, in Genesis 17, 1, which I've already read, Yahovah calls himself El Shaddai. Well, actually, it says Shaddai El, but I guess in English we reverse it. The lesson seems to think that he did that to contrast between the weakness of man and his might and power. I'd love to be able to ask you if you agree with that theory, but the powers that be won't allow that. You can answer it in your own mind. The Lord says in verse 1, I am the Almighty God, El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect. To me, he's telling Abram that he will give him his power so that Abram can be perfect as he is perfect, because only through him can he or any of us obey and keep his laws. In Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, it says God selected Abraham as his messenger through whom to communicate light to the world. The word of God came to him not with the presentation of flattering prospects in this life of a large salary, of great appreciation and worldly honor. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house and unto a land that I shall show thee was the divine message to Abraham. The patriarch obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. As God's light bearer to keep his name alive in the earth, he forsook his country, his home, his relatives, 
and all pleasant associations connected with his earthly life, to become a pilgrim and a stranger. Abraham's unquestioning obedience was one of the most striking instances of faith and reliance upon God that his to be found reliance upon God to be found in the sacred record with only the naked promise that his descendants should possess Canaan without the least outward evidence he followed on where God should lead fully and sincerely complying with the conditions on his part and the confident that the Lord would faithfully perform his word. The patriarch went out wheresoever God indicated his duty. He passed through wildernesses without terror. He went among idolatrous nations with the one thought. God has spoken. I am obeying his voice. He will guide. He will protect me. Remember when Christ said in John 8, 58, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. I think there is much we don't know about the father and his son. I'm so looking forward to learning the mysteries of the universe in eternity. Tuesday's lesson... Uh, is from Abram to Abraham, and we, we already discussed that, so let's go over to Wednesday's lesson. Covenant stages. So turn back to Genesis 12, 1 and 2. Genesis 12, 1 and 2. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I shall show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Okay. So the lesson tells us there are three stages of this covenant and this shows the first stages of the covenant of grace that he offered to Abraham or at that time he was Abram first the command and then the promise he is given the test of total trust in Yahovah and the promise given to his descendants and ultimately to all who follow the Lord Genesis 12, 3 says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This is another messianic promise pointing to the birth of Christ, the Messiah, to cleanse the world of sin for each one who believes on him. Then in Genesis 15, 7 through 18, Genesis 15, 7 through 18, right? 7 through 18. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land. To inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the middle, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram 
drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. And that shall go to thy fathers in peace, and that shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces. In that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. This, these verses record the ratification of the covenant. It, this was the traditional method of entering into a covenant at that time. They were to walk between the divided pieces of the sacrificed animals, symbolically vowing perpetual obedience to the provisions agreed upon. But notice that only Yahovah walked between the pieces. He himself has vowed eternal c compliance to the promises to Abraham and his descendants. Psalm 89:34 says, "My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips." And verse 37 of 89 it says, it shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. The third part of this covenant is in Genesis 17, 1 through 14. And we've already read through verse 9, so I'm going to start with verse 10. 10, 11, and the last part of 13. 17, 17, 17, 10. And this is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and they shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token or a sign of the covenant between me and you. And the last part of verse 13, And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Here was mankind's part of the bloody covenant. It was to symbolize giving every part of their lives to God. Everything they did, everything they said, everything they thought. In the Ministry of Healing, page 478 to 479, it says, many are unable to make definite plans for the future. Their life is unsettled. They cannot discern the outcome of affairs. And this often fills them with anxiety and unrest. Let us remember that the life of God's children in this world is a pilgrim life. We have not the wisdom to plan our own lives. It is not for us to shape our future. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should 
after receive her an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Too many, in planning for a brilliant future, make an utter failure. Let God plan for you. As a little child, trust to the guidance of him who will keep the feet of his saints. For Samuel 2, 9. God never leads leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. And in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1077, the spirit of bondage is engendered by seeking to live in accordance with legal religion through striving to fulfill the claims of the law in our own strength. There is hope for us only as we come under the Abrahamic covenant, which is the covenant of grace by faith in Christ Jesus. The gospel preached to Abraham through which he had hope was the same gospel that is preached to us today through which we have hope. Abraham looked unto Jesus, who is also the author and the finisher of our faith. There is only one covenant. I'm going to read Genesis eighteen nineteen. Genesis 18, 19. For I know him. This is Yahovah speaking about Abraham. That he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken unto him. The lesson says on um, Thursday, as we have seen so far, the covenant is always a covenant of grace, of God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. In his grace, God had chosen Abraham as his instrument to assist in proclaiming the plan of salvation to the world. Abraham's willingness to do righteously and to obey him by faith. Without that obedience on Abraham's part, God could not use him. Remember the scriptures say, the spirit of God is given to those who obey him. Okay. I'm now going to turn to The Glad Tidings by E.J. Wagner. I'm going to begin uh, with page 83 in my digital version. Uh, I've seen other versions where it begins on page 60. I'm going to be skipping through parts of it through to page 87. Quoting, There is only one line of descendants from Abraham, only one set of real children, and they are those who are of faith, those who by receiving Christ by faith receive power to become the sons of God. But while the seed is singular, meaning Christ, the promises are plural. All the promises of God are conveyed in Christ, in whom Abraham believed. We, according to the promise, Look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Second Peter 3, 7, 12, and 13. This is the heavenly country for which Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob looked. 
This gift of eternal life is included in the promise of the inheritance. For God promised the land, the land to Abraham and to his seed for an everlasting possession. Genesis 17:7 7 and 8. It is, an, it, it is an inheritance of righteousness because the promise that Abraham should be heir of the world was through the righteousness of faith. Righteousness, eternal life, and a place in which to live eternally. These are all in the promise, and they are all that could possibly be desired or given. That the covenant and the promise of God are one and the same. The covenant, that is, the promise of God to give men the whole earth made new after having made them free from the cursed, was confirmed or ratified before of God in Christ. He is the surety of our new covenant, even the everlasting covenant. For how many soever be the promises of God, in him is the yea, wherefore also through him is the amen, unto the glory of God through us. 2 Corinthians one twenty. In him we have obtained the inheritance, Ephesians 1.11. For the Holy Spirit is the first fruits of the inheritance, and the possession of the Holy Spirit is Christ himself dwelling in the heart by faith. God blessed Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And this is fulfilled in Christ, whom God has sent to bless us in turning us away from our iniquities. Acts three twenty-five and 26. The law cannot be make the covenant void. Do not forget as we proceed that the covenant and the promise are the same thing and that it conveys land, even the whole earth made new, to Abraham and his seed. And remember also that since only righteousness is to dwell in the new heaven and the new earth, promised to Abraham and his seed, the promise includes the making righteousness of all who believe. This is done in Christ, in whom the promise is confirmed or ratified. Now through it be but a man's covenant. Now though it be but a man's covenant, if it be not confirmed, no man disannuleth or addeth thereunto. Galatians 3.15 How much more must this be the case with God's covenant. Therefore, since perfect and everlasting righteousness was assured by the covenant made with Abraham, which was also confirmed in Christ by the oath of God, it is impossible that the law, which was spoken 430 years later, could introduce any new feature. The inheritance was given to Abraham by promise. But if after 430 years it should transpire that now the inheritance must be gained some other way, then the promise would be of no effect and the covenant would be made void. But that would involve the overthrow of God's government and the ending of his existence for he pledged his own existence to give Abraham and his seed the inheritance and the righteousness necessary for it. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13 The gospel was full and complete in the days of Abraham as it has ever been or ever will be. No addition to it or change in its provisions or conditions could possibly be made after God's oath to Abraham. Nothing can be taken away from it 
as it thus existed. And not one thing can ever be required from any man more than what was required of Abraham. And don't let anybody tell you any different. Not even if upcoming lessons try to do so this quarter. Let's pray. Dear loving Heavenly Father, I pray that we will enter into your covenant and promises that you gave to us through Abraham, that they may that we may overcome sin and share in that eternal inheritance that you have prepared for us. We see your prophecies fulfilling in our time that is so short. We need your power and grace in our lives. Thank you for always being there for us. In Christ's name I pray, amen.